So hello everyone. Welcome to this international panel. Uh, the title of this panel is Implementing Inclusive Pedagogy International Voices. The description uh, of the, the objective, actually the description of this panel, the objective of this, of this panel is to give a voice to international stakeholders who have graciously accepted to share with us examples of their implementation of inclusive pedagogy in higher education, their challenges and their successes. Panelists will inform us of where, uh, of where their respective country is in this process and share their vision for the future of inclusive pedagogy. We hope that these journeys can inspire us as we continue to reflect and contribute to the future of English pedagogy in Quebec. So uh, the way I was seeing this panel, I will uh, briefly uh, ask each panelist to introduce themselves. Then followed will be a 10 to 15 minute presentation from each panelist. And uh, we can then follow that with the discussion and questions. So I'd like to start uh, right away with, by presenting each panelist. Uh, I would like to present to you uh, Joanne Banks from Ireland. I thank you so much, Rock, and thanks for uh, for having us all here today. I'm very excited to be here. My name is Joanne Banks, and I'm a lecturer in inclusive education from Trinity College on a, a sunny day here in Dublin. That's great because it's raining here, so we'll take all the sun we can get. I would like to follow with uh, France with Arbert Stenbari. Your microphone, Arbert. So thank you, thank you for the organization of this roundtable. Um, I'm a, a pedagogical engineer at the Pedagogical Center of uh, University of Poitiers called Center for Resources Engineering, Engineering and uh, Pedagogical Initiatives. And uh, actually I'm uh, also a lecturer at the Department of Sociology here at the University of uh, Poitiers. Thank you, thank you, Arba. Uh, from Belgium, Valérie Van Hees. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Rock. I'm uh, Valerie van Heef. I'm uh, from Belgium, the Flemish community in Belgium, and uh, I'm the coordinator of the Support Center for Inclusive Higher Education. We are a cooperation between the Flemish government and all the universities uh, and universities of applied sciences in the Flemish community. And our core task is to support both the policy level, but also the higher education institutions in implementing equity and inclusion measures. So it's a great pleasure to be here today and to share a little bit the work we are doing in Belgium. Thank you. Thank you, Valérie. And now from New Zealand, where I understand it's uh, one o'clock in the morning tomorrow for us, uh, uh, Mike Stiles and Annette Van Lamuel. Annette? Kia ora. Uh, my name is Annette Van Lamuel. I'm program manager at an organization called Ako Aotearoa, and I'll tell you all about our organization soon. So we're beaming, Mike and I are beaming in from New Zealand, from a cold and frosty New Zealand. And we're very, we're delighted to be here today and share our story with you. Thank you. And Mike. Yes, uh, hello, kia ora everybody. As Annette has said, we're both from New Zealand. Annette is in the South Island, and I am in the North Island. Sometimes we refer to the South Island as the mainland because a little, it's a little bit bigger, but we are in the same country, and uh, I can't help but be very impressed with the technology that has been brought to bear to bring this all together. So well done to those people that have managed that. Thank you, Mike. Uh, now, uh, if we can start with uh, Joanne Banks with her uh, presentation. Can I just get a thumbs up that you can see my screen um, uh, properly now? Yes. Perfect. Um, okay, thanks a million. I'm going to kick off because uh, we don't have a huge amount of time. Um, but 
uh, yeah, as I said, thanks so much for, for having having me here today and uh, the, get the opportunity to hear all these uh, really lovely international voices on the topic of uh, inclusive education and inclusive pedagogy. Um, and really this presentation uh, is, is going to give you an overview um, of the, the, the inclusive education and our system of education here in Ireland and I suppose where we are in terms of an inclusive journey for want of a better word. So as I said, my name is Joanne Banks and I'm a lecturer here in the School of Education in Trinity College and uh, I lecture master's programmes uh, on the topic of a special and inclusive education and I've worked in, in research for, for many, many years on, on that same topic. Okay, so uh, the presentation today is going to look something like this, I hope. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of the Irish education system, so excuse me for those who already are familiar with it, but I'm coming at the basis that you don't know a huge amount about it, so uh, just so that you can relate, relate it to your own national context and your own national systems. Um, and I'm going to follow that up with the evolution of what we call uh, in Ireland still very much referred to as the special education uh, kind of sector, um, which runs parallel to our mainstream system. So I'm going to discuss that and, and uh, kind of current debates within that space. Um, I'm also going to refer to the higher education sector um, and in particular to the establishment of disability services um, in terms of improving access for students, but also more recent debates about EDI and the development of EDI policy across higher education institutions and where UDL fits within that. Um, I'm going to contextualize this in terms of policy uh, and the impact of the UNCRPD and what that's done in Ireland since we ratified in 2018. Um, and I'm going to close then with a mention, uh, uh, unashamedly uh, advertising my podcast, um, but if what I've done here is uh, I'm at the moment working on a book to develop uh, my podcast into a, a, an edited book where I want to draw out the key tensions that were raised with a series of interviews that I carried out with leading academics from around the world on this very topic of inclusive education. So hopefully it will provide some context to this session. So I'll just talk a little bit about the Irish education system. So for students with and without disabilities and, and, and any barriers to learning, if you like, we have a, a very general education system here in Ireland um, in that we don't track or stream students until very late in their school career. So for our primary is mainstream five to 12 years old generally. And um, we then have a junior cycle at lower secondary level for students aged 12 to 15. Uh, upper secondary, we have the leaving certificate applied and the vast majority of students take this academic program in order to access for Further in higher education or not. Um, uh, the Leaving Certificate Vocational Programme is essentially our Leaving Certificate with a slight vocational option for students to take certain vocational subjects. Um, and then we do have one uh, kind of tracking programme which is called the Leaving Certificate Applied, which is a pre-vocational programme uh, and students do not access uh, higher education from that programme. Um, as students then leave the system, their options then in terms of educational options are further in higher education. Um, and I just I uh, wanted to kind of display that alongside uh, this mainstream system where we do have, for example, special classes and resource mainstream provision, uh, we also operate a system of special schools and we have 123 special schools in Ireland, which cater for students through primary and post-primary. Um, if we were to kind of map that kind of specialized provision onto the further and higher education sector, we have uh, traditional kind of disability or access services for students at university. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Okay, so I just want to spend a couple of moments talking about where we were and where I think we are now. Um, and a lot of uh, the Irish development of special education is described in three different phases, the era of neglect and denial, the era of the special school and the era of integration and inclusion. And I've tried to kind of map this onto the well familiar inclusion dots, which I'm sure many of you have seen before. And um, so the era of neglect and denial was basically where students with disabilities weren't, were educa weren't educated, they weren't permitted to uh, access to the mainstream education. So in many ways it maps onto the exclusion uh, diagram there. Uh, the era of the special school was where many religious institutions in, in Ireland set up often residential settings for students with specific disabilities, such as uh, vision impairments uh, and hearing impairments, for example. Um, and this would have happened around the mid 20th century. Um, and I suppose somewhat after that, I think I always position Ireland somewhere between the integration dots and the inclusion dots, because we, we, 
we haven't committed yet. And so we then developed a series of special classes and these special classes continue to this day. As a matter of fact, we now have um, 1800 special classes in the country with over 100 special classes operating in mainstream, uh, uh, opening in mainstream education every year. And so I figure we're in this era of integration and inclusion, depending on the school context. And I suppose the cultural climate of that school, you would consider the system to be an integrated system where there's just physical placement of students with disabilities in mainstream education. In other schools, it's a fully inclusive model. So it really is quite variable across schools, uh, according often to the leadership of that school. So a lot of my research has pointed to that. So um, it is founded in, in, in evidence. Just for context, in terms of the, uh, the, the mainstream system, uh, we have carried out quite a bit of research and um, we had no knowledge up until about 10 years ago of just what proportion of the population were considered to have an additional need in our education context. So this is now at about 25 to 28%. And that's uh, pretty, pretty specific to students with disabilities rather than any other barriers to learning such as ethnicity and disadvantage, which is increasingly being spoken about now. So I would suspect that that uh, prevalence rate is, is quite high, which begs the question, is it helpful to have prevalence rates of these of this kind in the first place? We just have to possibly accept a level of diversity in our student population full stop. Um, in terms of higher education, uh, if I was to position UDL within any education sector in Ireland at present, it's in the higher education sector. And this is primarily down to an organization called AHEAD, which is the organization for higher education for students with disabilities. And they have uh, really been creating a lot of promotion and awareness of universal design. And I suppose this has trickled through in terms of practice in many of the uh, further and higher education institutions. Alongside this, the EDI policies have kicked in in the last number of years, and I just thought I'd raise that in Trinity College, where I am, I work, um, we have just launched the Trinity Inclusive Curriculum Project, um, which involves micro-credentials for staff who wish to undertake a, a kind of a UDL type micro-credential and to introduce kind of, for me then, a school champion, for example, to create awareness amongst colleagues and so on, and have that trickle uh, uh, spreading effect through departments. Um, but I'll talk about maybe systemic and structural barriers in a moment. Um, I thought I'd contextualize this a little in terms of basically what's happened in Ireland since 2018. We ratified the United Nations Convention on, on Persons with Disabilities and all of this has done is created a significant amount of debate in the country as to where we are at in terms of meeting our obligations, particularly in light of general comment for where issues around segregation, integration and inclusion are really clearly uh, defined for the very first time and really creates question marks over our system of special schools and special classes, but also at higher education level, the kind of uh, retrofitting uh, add on supports uh, to the mainstream that still continue uh, to exist, uh, where the kind of baseline supports maybe aren't getting as much emphasis as they as they could. So what I, what, I, uh, what I often say is where we are and maybe where we should be. So where we are is that it's administratively convenient at the moment to keep special education and disability se uh, services separate to the mainstream. It's well established. We have a legacy of these systems and for many, they work well, they work okay. And um, we are continually expanding add-on supports such as classes, schools and disability services. And I think importantly, and I've done a little bit of research on this, I think the funding models really need examination because as long as they are separate, they justify the separate uh, forms of support to these students. So by embedding this special education funding model, which in the Irish context has grown significantly in the last decade and has raised eyebrows at government level as to the extent to which we, like how, how sustainable it is going forward, I think these are questions that we need to ask. What we need to do, and this is where the debate lies, is we need to evaluate where we are and map that onto our obligations under UNCRPD. We need to have a proper conversation in Ireland about the value of segregated provision and the support models we offer across the education sectors. And also we need to have a real discussion around innovative pedagogies like UDL and inclusive curricula. And uh, I suppose it's this three eyes model. So the institutional factors, the instructional factors and the in interpersonal factors that impact on whether your system is inclusive system or not. 
So I'm going to close here with a, a, an overview of the podcast series that I carried out called Inclusion Dialogue last year. And I'd encourage you all to, to look it up on wherever you uh, access your, your podcasts. So excuse me if this feels like a touch of self-promotion, but there is an intention behind it in that I drew from the interviews um, the key themes that I thought were worth looking at. And I mentioned there the three the three eyes. Uh, so the institutional, and I'll start with that because consistently through throughout the 13 academics that I interviewed who many were 40 years working in the sector uh, in the area of inclusive education some people that were new to the to the area of as in uh, early career academics with very different perspectives so uh, institutional barriers came up again and again so these are the policies at higher education post-primary wherever you are the regulations in place at school level, perhaps the rules and punitive measures that are, are, are in operation, for example, and the attitudinal and cultural changes that are required. And this nicely fit into, I'd say, the majority of the interviews that I took with these leading academics. So I thought that that was something that I thought we could highlight perhaps here today and might come up in the other presentations. There was also a heavy emphasis in some of the podcasts on the interpersonal, so the, the role and power of the lecturer or teacher in impacting on inclusive education in their sector. So the types of quali and quality of those relationships between teachers and students, but also what came up again and again is the quality of relationships between lecturers and other lecturers or teachers and other teachers, and equally between the teaching staff and the administrative staff who are involved in resource allocation and how all of that works. So so I think the, the kind of teacher empowerment piece comes out in a few of them, particularly Lani Florian's interview really emphasized this quite strongly. And I, I learned a lot from talking to her, for example. And finally, then maybe we move on to the kind of UDL focus and, and uh, uh, Frederick Fauvet was actually one of my interviewees. And we talked in detail then about the kind of instructional practices in schools and the importance of them. So the importance of teacher capacity, confidence and professional learning, uh, the role of pedagogy uh, in impacting on whether systems are inclusive or not, and um, the types of assessments that are used and ways in which to overcome that. And obviously, we're, this all comes down to the curriculum that's available, but also how you can kind of circumnavigate maybe perhaps rigid curriculum uh, with, with pedagogies such as universal design for learning. The final point I'd like to, to, to close on is, is a question that perhaps we can, we can discuss throughout this, this uh, session. And it's really about measuring inclusive education. And the podcast interviews really highlighted this again and again. So how do we know when we have achieved this fabulous goal of inclusive education? The term, although it captures a lot, isn't very helpful sometimes. So how can we measure inclusive education and how do we know when we have arrived there and if there could be further debate I think is what a lot of my interviewees spoke about is that this needs attention and I suppose from the perspective of universal design for learning an evidence base there is also quite helpful if you wish to impact and influence policy. So Rock, I'm not sure about my time, but I'm I'm uh, I'm pretty pretty finished there. Uh, if anyone wants to access the podcasts, they're available on the usual platforms. I have my own academic website and my email address. And um, if anyone wishes to get in touch, um, I'm happy to take questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. You were you still had a minute left. <laughs> Just for uh, us here on the other side of the Atlantic Pond, uh, just if you can just maybe uh, tell us what UNCRPD is, just describe it a little bit. Uh Apologies. Yes. Yeah, so the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, so we signed it in 2007. So it's an international convention that countries um, basically uh, uh, signed up to, uh, a lot of countries signed up to in the mid-2000s, in 2007 when it was introduced. Uh, unfortunately, it took Ireland until 2018 to ratify it, which means that we were uh, committing to adhering to the, the uh, obligations within that act. And we have to report to the United United Nations um, on, on a frequent basis as to how we're getting on in achieving those goals. So there was just a newspaper article on Monday about how Ireland is failing in meeting its obligations. So I thought it was interesting in the run up to this today. Thank you, Joanne. And I thought very interesting that that whole uh, aspect of how do we measure inclusion uh, mm. pedagogy. And we'll certainly go and listen to all your podcasts. I, they, they, they seem very, very interesting. Great, thank, thank you. you.
Now, uh, we will be taking, uh, uh, we will have a, a question and discussion period after the four presentations. So I was thinking maybe we can uh, right away go straight to Arbert Stembari from France. Uh, thank you, Rock. I'm going to share my, my PowerPoint. Okay, so um, I, 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 chose a I chose a different, let's say, uh, style of presentation. It's more, let's say, personal. I would like to share with you my, uh, let's say, so I'm, I'm going to question the, over, so yeah, the situation from an overview to the University of Poitiers. But uh, first, I would like to, to share with you a little bit my, this is my, jour my journey to, to, the, to the inclusive, uh, to the ped uh, inclusive pedagogy issue. Uh, so first of all, um, I, I uh, finished a thesis in sociology on the, on the recognition of civil, uh, civilian victims of the Kosovo War at uh, 2016 at the University of Limoges, is a city here near Poitiers. Uh, and uh, I, spent, uh, I spent more than a year in Kosovo interviewing, doing an ethnograph, um, eth eth ethnographical work interviewing civil war civil, um, civil war victims and also uh, former uh, co uh, former fighters of the Albanian guerrilla of the war of uh, uh, 1999 uh, and uh, during this time I've also uh, had an experience on teaching at the University of Limoges in Poitiers and uh, since uh, 2018, I'm, uh, I work as a pedagogical uh, advisor in charge of uh, knowledge transfer or research transfer at our pedagogical center. So um, uh, I decided to, to begin to, to give this background. Why? Because um, in my everyday work, uh, yeah, the, the, even it's, it's a different, uh, it's a completely different context. It reminds me that work I did in the, in the case of my thesis. And uh, sometimes I think it's very, it's very important to, to, let's say, to proceed to a comparison, because uh, in Kosovo I was questioning how this, all these social categories coming from the war were, uh, were struggling to, 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 to be integrated, to be included in the society of Kosovo post-war. Uh, so here is not a war, but let's say here are other, let's say, issues in the university in France, and sometimes this, com this asymmetric comparison is important to see. Uh, so at 2018, I began to work here at the Pedagogical Center of, uh, of University of Poitiers. And again, why I'm talking to you about, about this, our center? Because this roundtable is about uh, inclusive pedagogy, but it's very important to talk, let's say, about the conditions that uh, create the possibility to, to, to go toward this question. And the question of pedagogy, in uh, not only in the University of, uh, of uh, Poitiers, but in higher education in France is, um, uh, is, is, uh, is very, is, uh, since, uh, for example, since 2018, the, uh, the trainings on pedagogy are obligatory. So, uh, our pedag pedagogical center was created in 2014. So, of course, the university, the, the uh, pedagogical uh, question uh, is 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 uh, date from from years and years. But uh, let's say the, the the trainings on these questions are from let's say uh, uh, from less less than 10, 10 years. Uh, so here, is the, here um, in our center, uh, pedagogical center, so we are offering trainings and uh, pedagogical uh, accompaniments, both face-to-face -face or online to teachers and teacher researchers, because there are two different status here. Um, and also we offer them a lot of uh, resources, tools uh, to help them to, the, uh, to help them to, to, to improve uh, the, 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 the the teaching designs, for example. Um, if, uh, if, we, if I can categorize uh, our three main objectives here at our centers, first is the teacher professional de development uh, through support, advice, trainings. Uh, and this part, and I'm going to talk a little bit later about this, I think is extremely important as we are talking about inclusive pedagogy. Uh, to so this kind of investment uh, on the on the professional development of the teachers is is, is crucial. 
second, uh, there is a part of, uh, we have developed, let's say, a program with, um, we call this obs Observatory of Pedagogical Practices. So we try to, 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 for, to, to create, let's say, an inventory of uh, in, uh, innovative practices. But also we try to make, to put more visibility to inclusive, for example, practices. Uh, I don't know, maybe in your universities, because I have seen a little bit, uh, we are very attentive to what you do in, in Canada, for example. Uh, classroom observation are maybe a common practice, I don't know, but here we, we introduced that uh, like two years ago. For the first time, we, to, uh, the first uh, classroom observation began two years ago here. And you can't imagine how many debates that idea created here. Uh, it's not, it's, it's absolutely not the same situation in the secondary level. I'm talking only about the higher education. And the third, and the third, uh, and the third objective where the trip, we are creating a lot of resources, edu educational resources. And, uh, and uh, in the context of COVID-19, there was very useful to the teachings missions. So, um, now, as I was describing my journey to the to the inclusive pedagogy, uh, uh, I want to say that when, uh, when I arrived at the pedagogical center here and I had a look on the, the offer, pedagogical offer we had, we were proposing to the teachers, uh, maybe because I was a sociologist and I was sensitive to this question, so I proposed uh, uh, this uh, a training on uh, inclusive pedagogy. It was the first, the first ever uh, training pedagogical training at the university of poitiers at uh, november november 2018 so um but uh, the the question was so I'm, I'm i'm going to try to describe a little bit what i was feeling in the time uh, the question is where to start uh, because this question as as joanna uh, told before is, is it's a very broad topic of inclusion and uh, it's very important i i i think to to to, to say that the question of resources is very important too on this. So we were like two or three colleagues working on that, uh, on this, on this topic. So we try, uh, we in this, for this first, let's say training, we try to concentrate on the question of disabilities and the students uh, who are, we say in French, in you know, a situation de handicap. Uh, and uh, we, okay, there were pedagogical advisor who, who we intervened in these trainings, but also we, enter, we invited uh, the psychologists, uh, doctors, uh, teachers, uh, and students too. Um, another question is very important. Is I so I, I put the title "Training the Trainers" because, of course, uh, the we are in the center where the most part of my colleagues we are were ten uh, pedagogical advisor in all. Uh, trying to cover all the fields, academic fields of our university. But uh, it's important to say that uh, the pedagogical advisor in France is not, let's say, a profession. It's, 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 it looks more like a set of missions. Uh, and uh, the, most, uh, the most part of pedagogical advisors, uh, not only in Poitiers, but in, in the most part of France, uh, have never, have never uh, teach in the university. They have experience as trainers in uh, the private sector, for example, but uh, they have never teach in the in the university. So, for uh, the most part of them, they leave this as a convert uh, as a um, in conversion. Uh, as a, they are converting to another profession, and it's very important to say that the precarious uh, precariousness of the pedagogical advisor in higher education. Uh, we have to maybe I think it's important to to talk about that because. Oh, there are, let's say, the small hands who make possible the trainings, for example, the, the, the activities they are having place in the campus about the inclusion, inclusive uh, issues. But in the same time, so, uh, we, we don't have to forget that this, there is no magic. Huh? The, 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 the work conditions uh, sometimes are not easy. Uh, so we have so in so we uh, in the same times we are uh, we are thinking how to train our teachers. We have done a lot of work on ourselves, uh, uh, proposing internal trainings at the center between pedagogical advisors or creating bridges with other universities and sharing experiences. And uh, the con in the context of COVID nineteen, uh, it was uh, uh, let's say we saw it okay or. Uh, also as an opportunity 
to learn and to, to, to improve on the, all the digi digital skills because uh, the question of accessibility was, was, was very, very important during this, uh, this, uh, this period. Uh, I'm going to, uh, so I'm, I'm not make, I'm not, go I'm not going to make an inventory of all actions that are, are taking place in the University of Poitiers, but University of Poitiers have uh, a strategy, uh, official strategy uh, to, for, for the inclusion uh, and, uh, the, and toward the disabilities issues. So I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, mentioning the most important, let's say, activities. Uh, there are um, uh, activities tra uh, treating this question of inclusi uh, inclusivity. And we are trying to align this activity with the municipality of Poitiers. For example, the, uh, the, the, the city of Poitiers is organizing every year a solidarity festival uh, to, to promote uh, this question called the Les Accessifs. So we're organizing here at the campus too some activities. Uh, and there, there are a lot of, uh, lot of activity, a lot of activities. We're trying to, to build bridges, let's say, between, between the higher education and the secondary level with the high schools. So there are pedagogical advisors here or colleagues from the service, the handicap service, they're going to the high schools of Poitiers and, uh, and, and trying to talk to, to, to the students, to all the students uh, about these questions, but also encourage, uh, encouraging students with uh, dis disabilities to, uh, to continue the studies in higher education. Um, then uh, there are, if we take the definition in a broad, uh, in a broad uh, let's say, way, uh, we can talk also for other programs. For example, uh, at the University of Poitiers, we have a program uh, for the reception of refugee, refugee students. Uh, and uh, we are also par partners in, the, in a national project called ASPI Friendly. Uh, is a is a project who, who, who try uh, who try to raise awareness toward uh, autism and uh, the Asperger autism. The, to finish, uh, I, I if I so the, the, in a global uh, in a global way, I would say that I uh, since uh, uh, the, yes, the University of Poitiers, but also in in the most part of uh, in the most part of University of France. This, the question of pedagogy is, is raising more and more, so it's a growing dynamic. And, the, and uh, inside, let's say, this set of, uh, of, um, of work, the question of inclusive pedagogy is, is growing too. So, and uh, more and more the university, because I compared it a bit what they do in Strasbourg, what they do in Paris, in Bordeaux, etc. We see that uh, we're going more and more from, a, from particular, let's say, interventions about inclusive pedagogy to more, let's say, a systemic approach. And this systemic approach is what it's doing now, is, is let's say, uh, is, is uh, increasingly, uh, is increasing the definition of the inclusive pedagogy. So for example, last, last week, for the, again, for the first time here, it, uh, here at the, our pedagogical center, we proposed and we animated a training uh, on the interculturality. And, uh, uh, but other 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 themes are to are to uh, can be object of other trainings for for example student parenting uh, uh, for uh, trainings about gender issues etc. So I am gonna I, I can stop here but we can discuss uh, further. Merci Albert. Thank you Albert. Uh, that was very interesting, and I, I I hear you when you talk about context. You know, uh, inclusive pedagogy is necessarily is is has a context behind it, and we need to start point A and and, and try to journey towards point B, C, D, and the systemic approach really talks to me also. So I, I really liked uh, your presentation. Thank you. Next uh, would be uh, Valérie Van Hees from Belgium. And Valérie, I believe I am the one running the PowerPoint. Let me just start that. Yeah. Okay, that's great. You can uh, surely share my PowerPoint. Thanks for your uh, support. <laughs> I think it's... Just... Uh, if you would prefer, screen. I can also... Um... Should be getting it now. Okay. 
Okay. We Oops. only need it in the presentation mode. Is it in the presentation mode? Not, not yet. Not yet. Uh... Okay, I think you, you're sharing your, um, you, you have the PowerPoint on, your, on another screen, maybe, because you're not sharing the, the right screen, I think. Yes, you're right. I'm, uh, I'm sorry for this technical issue. You have to select the screen where the the, the slides are, sh are showing, if you have several screens. Yeah, okay. that's good. Yeah, okay, that's okay. great. Um, thank you so much again for uh, the invitation. I will uh, bring um, the approach that we are implementing at this stage in uh, the Flemish community on universal design and uh, inclusive pedagogies. And uh, as mentioned, I'm uh, the coordinator of the support center for inclusive higher education. On the next slides, um, you will see, can you go to the next slide? Yeah. Okay, you can see again um, the definition a little bit of the support center for inclusive higher education. Uh, maybe good to know in, in comparison with uh, Ireland, it was in 2009 uh, that Belgium uh, ratified the UN conventions on uh, persons with disabilities. And it was at that moment that our government in the Flemish community decided uh, to found and create a support center for inclusive uh, higher education and embed that uh, into the higher education um, legislation and, and decree. So SIGO is embedded uh, by decree and we are a cooperation between the Flemish government and the universities association. And as you can see, um, it's the banner of our website, uh, the support center for inclusive higher education. We serve both the policymakers and with the policymakers, I'm uh, referring to the Flemish government, to the minister of education, but also the higher education institutions and the policy officers in the higher education institutions and at national level in the development of um, an implementation foremost also of uh, inclusion measures for inclusive uh, higher education. So it was really founded at the beginning um, with uh, the aim to support the participation of students with disabilities uh, in higher education. So on the next slide, you can also see a little bit um, activities that we are doing with SIGO. Uh, for example, to realize the ambition that we are growing and increasing uh, towards inclusive higher education in the Flemish community, we have uh, appointed, appointed uh, one inclusion officer officer at uh, each university. We have uh, 18 universities that we are supporting. And uh, together with them and uh, the Minister of Education, we form a uh, learning network. So we, we are bringing them together at regular times. And uh, in that sense, we are learning and supporting them uh, on their experiences uh, and struggles and barriers um, in towards uh, implementing uh, higher uh, inclusive higher education. So um, we also are a little bit the specialists in inclusion, you could say experts, uh, the colleagues, and uh, they are developing guidelines, training, coachings um, to support each of the stakeholders um, in uh, realizing inclusive higher education. We are also uh, creating some tools also to enhance also the participation of uh, students uh, with disabilities. Um, and it should be said that uh, in a later stage, but I will come uh, back to that, that we are now focusing more and more on inclusion at large and a little bit um, not only taking the approach uh, towards students uh, with disabilities. Um, it was now uh, in 2020 uh, for the next five years, because we have each time a covenant of the Flemish government with really this describing the task uh, on which we should focus uh, with the grants that we are receiving from uh, the minister. And um, in, in the, this uh, five years now, we are really focusing on um, yeah, moving further to inclusive uh, universities. And um, as Joanne did a postcard, uh, podcast uh, series on, um, yeah, 
um, practices across the world. We, we also did it on, on the topic of uh, UDL in higher education. It was also a uh, series that I was um, doing in co-production with uh, Frederick Fauve. We still have two sessions to go, so um, you can also read more about that on our uh, website. But today I would like to focus on, on one case study, one of our universities that we have trained, coached on the topic of uh, inclusive uh, higher education because it's giving a little bit a perspective in what is the approach that we are trying to take um, towards the inclusive universities that we aim uh, to focus on. So on the next slides, um, you will see that we had an important turning point in 2017. Um, um, before we had uh, a regulation when we had um, ratified the UN Convention on, on Inclusive Higher Education, we had already um, some rules and legislation that universities uh, were um, yeah, asked to embed reasonable adjustments uh, for students with disabilities. And uh, at that stage in 2009, we, we saw for most that universities were implementing a little bit a categorical approach. So they were focusing for most on reasonable adjustments, but also already had in mind we should apply uh, universal design in practice as well. But we saw that it was really a categorical approach and that they were foremost focusing on the reasonable adjustments approach, not only for uh, students with disabilities, but also for other uh, students, for example, also like students with a migration background. But it was still obvious that it was a categorical approach um, that they were using. And in 2017, we advised our Minister of uh, Education uh, to change the regulation and to now, in, instead of ensuring reasonable adjustments to work on the represented group, they embedded really an, an inclusive higher education legislation in which they were asked and forced universities to take universal design as the approach, as the basic approach. So what we are trying to do now is to make it more into a continued approach and we are um, supporting our universities really in broadening up the universal design approach and starting to design all the services, not only teaching and learning, but also the student services, communication departments, and so on, with um, a viewpoint of diversity from onset. So the, really the, the UDL approach uh, that you could say. And we are also trying um, to learn to reflect them on which uh, uh, reasonable adjustment that we are now implementing could we embed also in the universal design approach. So for example, we, we saw that uh, extended time for uh, exams and studies is uh, a an, an reasonable adjustment that almost all the students who were there in the reasonable adjustments approach uh, were using. So now we are um, reflecting with universities, would it not be better, for example, to give all the students extra time so that we have more a universal design setting for all the students. So that's a little bit the movement that we are also asked to take uh, by the government uh, in the Flemish community. And today I will present very shortly um, the concrete practice of um, Odyssey University of Applied Sciences on, on that topic. So on the next slide, you will just uh, see an um, a little bit how we define universal design. Um, it's important to, to, to mention that we see it as a design of products, environments, programs, services. So that's why in the Flemish community, we are not speaking about UDL, but we are speaking about universal design because we think it really applies to all the, the topics that university life uh, is, um, is ongoing. And uh, reasonable adjustments, we define it as specific adjustments when needed. Uh, and it's also ensured for students with disabilities, but also for working students, top athletes, uh, and so on. So on the next slide, um, you will see that uh, Odyssey University of Applied Sciences is, is a university we have in the Flemish community, and uh, they have approximately uh, 10,000 students, 25 bachelor programs, uh, degrees, um, and um, they asked our support um, for the new university mission and vision plan. And there you see the ambition that uh, in seven years, um, Odyssey really aims to become a sustainable, flexible, 
an inclusive co-university of uh, applying sciences. So they are really focused to guarantee an inclusive learning environment with equal uh, educational opportunities for each and every student based on an active uh, interaction between students, staff and actors uh, from the fields and universal design forms the starting point. So we were very happy that one of the universities if you know the legislation, really embedded this into a strategic uh, mission and vision of uh, the university. Uh, on the next slide, you will see um, that uh, universal design formed a, a starting point. And I, I will not go to that in depth, but um, to mention in their strategic plan, they really concretize this. And that's what we think it's, it's very important that we ask our universities to, to really make that at a concrete level and not saying yeah, DL is a starting point or UD, but how will you do it? And for example, here you see um, that it applies to all the stuff uh, of the universal, of your, university that educational design uh, in which uh, diversity is recognized and sufficient differentiation is provided so that education and there also they really concretize what they mean with that is accessible to all the students. Um, also they concretize it in how they will create the learning environments um, and here you see that it's really all the components in a very concrete manner. It's not saying we will do UD, but for all the teachers and uh, academic staff at the universities, they are really mentioning on what they expect of the staff and what they want to realize uh, with the university. On the next slide, you will also see then um, a little bit further that it's an approach that they not only want to take with, with one team member, but you see there's really an educational team that uh, is in the university and takes up the role uh, related to curriculum design and really support all the faculties uh, in uh, the university um, to that um, process. And also really important is that also students take ownership. So. I mentioned they want to be a co-university and co-creation is, of course, taking also students um, the ownership of um, the learning process uh, in that. But what I wanted to focus now is on the inclusive exam and pedagogical uh, measures that they have taken. On the next slide, you will indeed see in the table. Valeria, very have five minutes left. Is yeah, there... OK, that's good. I will manage. <laughs> So here you just will see that they really have now, for example, extended uh, exam, uh, exam time uh, for all students and they really also uh, yeah, mention in the regulations of the universities what they really expect uh, to be done by uh, teachers on that topic. Also read aloud the questions for each and every student. Uh, on the next slide you will also see um, other um yeah measures that are taking regarding language basic mathematical operations also food and drink so it's really in assessment taking a lot of measures that were beyond uh, of before in 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 as i called the increased care is now in, in the basic care for all uh, the students on the next slide you will also see that they also have um really concrete uh inclusive pedagogical uh, measures uh, for uh, the educational class, classes. So for example, you see that uh, teachers uh, should have clear assignments. Uh, they also should offer appropriate assignments uh, beforehand uh, to students. They have to post the learning support materials prior to lesson. They have to record the lessons uh, for each and every student and so on. So we are very happy with this approach because it's a really concrete and uh, approach that uh, universities are taking and expecting uh, by all the universities. On the next slide, you will we'll also see um, that it's really um, what's a success that it has been implemented and has been evaluated also very positive, is that it was really a participatory approach that um, they had the intention of we want to be an in inclusive universities, but then the installment, as I mentioned, of an UDL team composed both of staff members of central education, but also diversity and student services, they did really an in-depth analysis of 
the institutional reasonable adjustments. And then they started really in a consultation uh, process um, with the whole university stakeholders. You will see that if you look in depth later on at um, those topics that, um, yeah, it was really an, an approach on, on looking at how the different faculties looked at this and then they, they managed to make really an UDL memo that was supported and approved by uh, the university board and also the educational council of um, the universities and then in April they also did the first evaluation of implementation and I think uh, that's always really important uh, to do and on the next slide you will um, see as well that uh, they did online service with uh, the teachers, consultation of the study programs, also interviews with students, and also the, the consultation of the educational uh, council because they are also following up all the processes and difficulties that should have been, for example. But then uh, they really say it was evaluated in a positive uh, manner by all the stakeholders. Uh, and they really stand behind the inclusive measures because they believe that have put them to the team of inclusive higher education uh, really on the map uh, in Odyssey. So that's a very good point. And in the final slides, um, maybe you can also see in, in a quantitative matter that really um, a lot of the teachers really stand behind the measure. And I think that's important, not only implementing, but evaluating. And if you have also positive evaluations, it's also the motor um, to create further um, improvements in the inclusive pedagogies at uh, University of uh, Odyssey. So I think we can go to the next slide. And also say that um, what Odyssey is now aiming, they are evaluating the approach, but they are also monitoring. And we have, for example, also seen that uh, the number of students uh, with disabilities that were asking and applying for reasonable adjustments is also decreasing. So we also see that that's a positive impact and that they also want to, to make the key ingredients of an inclusive and qualitative approach within the higher education, that they really want to collaborate further and create more inclusive cultures and implementation of uh, inclusive uh, practices. So in that sense, we have now three universities uh, of applied sciences. We are really into that process already and so they are inspiring also the other universities um, in our country and i think that's wonderful to see that um, an approach step by step in a participatory way and of course with a legislation that allows um, this topic um, that uh, is one of, of the directions uh, that we are taking in belgium so if you would have some questions about it we can uh, surely uh, yeah exchange on that and we also have published in the new book of uh, Friedrich Fauvet it's also mentioned as an, a chapter more in depth uh, the approach of uh, Odyssey University of Applied Sciences. So I would like to thank you for the attention on uh, on this presentation. I can find my microphone there you go. Thank you very much uh, Valérie. For that, I really enjoyed the uh, the participatory approach. Uh, obviously, co-construction always works well, I think, and I think it's necessary uh, to to. I found it interesting too that you had inclusion officers uh, throughout. Uh, so somebody that I imagine can train the trainers, as uh, Albert was mentioning. So yeah, very interesting, and I hope we'll have uh, we'll be able to discuss further uh, in the question period. Now, uh, last but not least, New Zealand with uh, Mike Stiles and Annette Van Lemuen. Okay, here we go. Welcome to our presentation and we'd like to start with a very short clip.
enga mana, enga reo, enga iwi, e rau rangatira ma, nau mai haere mai. Welcome to our presentation on the New Zealand Dyslexia Friendly Quality Mark and Inclusive Pedagogy in Aotearoa, New Zealand. In New Zealand, we like to start our presentations with a whakatauki, which is a proverb, which is appropriate to the theme of our presentation. And for this presentation, we've chosen this proverb. He aha te mea noi o te au, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. What is the most important thing? It is people, it is people, it is people. And we chose this proverb, not just because it's relevant to our presentation, but to the theme of this symposium. And I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Mike Stiles, who will kick off and share our journey towards the, the New Zealand Dyslexia Friendly Quality Mark. Yora, thanks, um, Annette. Um, just to let you all know, uh, I'm in uh, the North Island, as I said before, and Annette's in the South, and she's going to be driving the PowerPoint presentation today. So if you hear a short stop, that's because um, Annette's changing the PowerPoint. So I'm very excited and proud to talk to you today and introduce the dyslexia-friendly quality mark that's an initiative that's just being implemented in New Zealand. It, um, there was some debate initially as to whether we would call it the dyslexia friendly quality mark or the neurodiversity friendly quality mark, but we've gone initially at least with dyslexia friendly. It was inspired by an initiative in the United Kingdom, but we've taken it and we've made it a purpose built uh, initiative for a New Zealand environment. You may or may not know that um, New Zealand is uh, guided and driven a lot by the Treaty of Waitangi, which is the treaty between the indigenous Maori people of New Zealand and the um, largely European uh, people who've come to New Zealand. And one of the important things that we are required to do and we actively seek to do is to consult visibly and overtly with Maori people. And we are doing that and have done this for this project. Now the dyslexia friendly quality mark is currently being trialed and road tested. And it will go live in the second half of 2021. What we're excited about is that there are a list of organizations keen to sign up to this and we're optimistic that it will become a central feature of tertiary education in New Zealand. If you could move the page now, Annette, please. So what is the quality mark and what do providers have to do? Well, it's a holistic initiative that requires the whole organization to buy in. One of the central features is the dyslexia friendly charter. And that's a little bit like marriage vows in that um, the organization publicly declares by way of its website and a statement inside the front vestibule of the organization that it is a dyslexia friendly organization and that it has met the standards required to be a dyslexia friendly organization and it's committed to supporting learners with dyslexia. Okay, moving on. Thank you, Annette. So what does the dyslexia friendly quality mark look like? We've developed a set of standards that covers the governance of the organization, things like board policies and allocating resources. It includes uh, or requires actions by senior management. One of those things would be to appoint a dyslexia champion inside the organization. The quality mark provides for and insists that all tutor or education staff will have been trained on 
dyslexia and good practices to support dyslexic learners. That um, uh, support and training also goes to learning support staff and to resource writers and people that maintain the website. The aim is that uh, the Dyslexia Friendly Quality Mark should be incorporated into the DNA of the organization. It shouldn't be just something on the surface. It should be something that the, that the tertiary education provider um, owns and it's, uh, in, it's in everything that the organization does. And also it would, should show up in marketing and PR uh, promotion or activities. Thanks, Annie. So once an organization has met the standards, there will be a verification visit and the organization will get to show what it's done to meet the standard. And if the verification visit is successful, the quality mark will be awarded for a three year period. So at the end of three years, each institution will be required to submit fresh evidence to show that they've grown in their actions and their responses to support dyslexic learners. You may, by the way, be thinking, why is it that this is starting at tertiary level rather than primary and or secondary level? And the answer to that really is that the incentive and the enthusiasm to do this existed um, at tertiary level and both myself and Annette are key people in driving this initiative in New Zealand. And just one other point before we move to the next page, it is my very strong impression from attending conferences in the UK, in uh, Europe and in Australia, that most countries, certainly most OEC date, OECD countries don't yet do a particularly good job in supporting learners that have dyslexia and other neurodiverse conditions. Thank you, Annie. So what is the value proposition of an organization signing up for the dyslexia friendly quality mark? Because it will be a rigorous and demanding um, process, tertiary education organisations will have to make a serious commitment in order to achieve it. In return, the quality mark will provide a benchmark for best practice. It will also provide a focus for ongoing professional development for staff keeping in mind that what is good for learners with dyslexia is largely good for all learners. And I'm inter interested to see there is a lot of references today, pardon me, to the universal um, design for living, um, or for learning uh, principles, and I'm very excited by that. The other thing that is very important, I believe, is that learners with dyslexia will feel safe in an educational institution that is dyslexia friendly and that the organization itself will be able to use the dyslexia friendly quality mark as a point of difference and as a focus for marketing and promotion. Thank you, Annie. So in summary, we believe in New Zealand that the introduction of this quality mark is a tangible step towards supporting a group of learners that have not been well supported in the past. Thank you, that's my bit over now, and I'm gonna hand over to Annette to drive the rest. And before we hand over to me, maybe we can have the poll now? Ah, of course. Yes, here we are. Mike, would you like to talk us through it? Yes, thank you. Um, so, Question number one, the Māori name for, for New Zealand is Aotearoa. What does that mean? Uh, the three answers, the land of two halves, 
the land of the long white cloud, the land of the emerald sea and abundant fish. And um, you can answer that question, I believe, in the poll function. Question number two, what is the official language of New Zealand? Is it English? Is it Māori? Or is it true that New Zealand has three official languages? And the third question, and this is one that we are very interested to hear about. Is there legislation in your country for supporting learners with dyslexia? Yes, there is overt legislation, or maybe no, there's not of, um, of uh, overt uh, legislation. I think there might be a second page now. Can it? Oh, there's, you, you can scroll down to number four oh, to the fourth question. Oh, I didn't see that. I'm a slow learner. No, I can't. Oh, yes, I can. Here we go. So, uh, please tick, is there overt legislation or no, we have no legislation or we have legislation, but it is not effective. And, and then below that is question four. Question four, what is the level of dyslexia support in the tertiary educate, uh, in the tertiary sector in your country? So uh, dyslexia of, of is funded, uh, is professional development for educators funded and provided, is assistive technology funded, or is no technology funded? Or is no funding available at all for specifically for um, dyslexia? So then you could could submit that. We would be very keen to hear about your uh, responses to this. Thank you very much. Can we see the results? So that would be good if we could. Well, oh, here they are. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, and look. Very bright group. The correct answer for number one is the land of the long white cloud. So a very intelligent group of people we've got today. And then question number two, New Zealand, 89% um, of you says it's got three official languages. And yes, it does. We the, the three official languages are English, Te Reo Māori, and sign language is an official language uh, in New Zealand. And then moving down to the next one, this is the one we're very interested in. Uh, yes, there is overt legislation, 11%. No, we have no legislation, 56%. We have legislation, but it's not effective. And last question, what is the level of dyslexia support in the tertiary sector in your country? Um, dyslexia screenings are funded none. Professional development for educators is funded 11%. Assistive technology is funded. 56%, no funding is available, 33%. Look, thank you very much for that. We would love to get a, um, a keep a copy of that uh, because that's very useful information for us. So thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much, Mike. And um, what I'm going to show you next is how the New Zealand Dyslexia Friendly Quality Mark fits into the wider work, in the, into the broader scope of our work. Our organization is called Ako Aotearoa. Ako is the Maori word for teaching and learning, in particular, the reciprocal nature of teaching and learning. And Aotearoa, as you know, is our name for New Zealand. Ako Aotearoa is the National Centre for Tertiary Teaching Excellence. And as Mike explained before, New Zealand is a bicultural nation. We've got the Maori people as our indigenous people. And our founding document is the Tiriti o Waitangi, the Treaty of Waitangi. And 
and Aquateroa strives to be a bicultural nation. Our mission is to enhance the quality of teaching and learning at all levels of tertiary education. So we work with a wide range of tertiary teachers from foundation learning through to vocational education and higher education. I'll just give you a quick snapshot of our work at Ako Aotearoa. So we have the Tertiary Teaching Excellence Awards, where we celebrate the work of New Zealand's top tertiary teachers. We conduct and commission research. We have a fantastic website with a wealth of resources on tertiary teaching. And we offer professional learning and development opportunities in the form of courses, workshops, webinars, communities of practice, events, etc. Oh, sorry. These are our organizational values. And our work is grounded in our values and guided by these values of Pumautanga, stability and trust, Maramatanga, insight, Fakamanatanga, empowerment, Afitanga, inclusion, and Fanaungatanga, relationships and collaboration. This is my team, and uh, Akuatiaroa has been around since 2007, but my team was formed in 2018. Up until now, we've been called the LNEC team, the Adult Literacy, Numeracy and Cultural Capability team. But this acronym was always a placeholder, so we're currently choosing a new name for our team, so watch this space. What, I'm, what I'll share with you very briefly, because I know we're running out of time, Rock, I'll be very quick, is I'll share with you some of the milestones in our journey towards inclusion in New Zealand. So I'll just touch on some of these milestones next. Back in 2018, when we started our work with my team, we investigated what really works in building educational capability in the tertiary sector. And based on this research, we built a new model. At the foundation of our model sits the Tapatoru, our foundation learning professional standards framework, which informs the adult literacy and numeracy effective practice model, which describes what good practice looks like. This in turn informs the capability building model and we have our professional learning and development opportunities. A key feature of our model is that we integrate two capabilities. We build capability, cultural capability alongside educational capability. So we build the two at the same time because for learners to get the most out of their education, they need to be engaged. And the best way to get them engaged is if the teaching is culturally responsive. Lots of good reasons for integrating um, educational and cultural capability. And as you may know, in New Zealand, we have two large learner groups which have traditionally been disadvantaged. We have our Maori learners and our Pacific learners. What we are seeing is a distinct achievement gap between the total population in New Zealand and our Maori and Pacific learners. And we're trying very hard to address this inequity. As you will appreciate, adult learners in New Zealand are a very diverse group with a diversity of needs. And we need to equip our educators to meet these needs. And we've heard a lot about this at this symposium already. So it's, it's nothing new in New Zealand. What we are finding is that learners are not just supported by teachers, but by a range of people in different roles. And these people can provide the wraparound holistic support that learners need. So our target group is very diverse. It includes university lecturers, intensive literacy and numeracy tutors, workplace tutors, community-based educators, but also people in non-teaching roles. 
such as um, instructional designers and industry training uh, staff and even employers. So we aim to upskill all of these people so that they in turn can provide quality support to the learners. One of the milestones in our journey has been the development of the Maori cultural capability pathway and our Pacific cultural centeredness pathway. And these are free online resources which educators can access in their own time and at their own pace to learn more about the cultural values and strategies for engaging with Maori and Pacific learners. Another milestone in our journey has been the Tapatoru, our Foundation Learning Professional Standards Framework. This framework has three dimensions, professional values, professional practice and professional knowledge. And educators can measure themselves against these standards. It, as you can see, it has the learner in the middle. So it's very much a learner centered framework and it promotes values-based teaching. Another milestone in our journey has been our work in learner agency, which is closely aligned with the lifelong learning paradigm. And um, because it's, it's really important for us to equip our learners with the skills they need to meet the demands of our ever-changing environment, learners need to be agentic learners. So we've developed a think piece, which is on our website, resources and professional development in learner agency, so that um, educators can embed learner agency into their delivery. One of the real successes has been on your neurodiversity community of practice, which we set up last year for anyone who has an interest in neurodiversity or expertise in neurodiversity. We have an online platform where we share resources and research and experiences. And uh, we meet a few times online, a few times a year, and we um, invite guest speakers. And what we're finding is that there's a huge need among people to learn more about how to support neurodiverse learners. And um, what we're, what we're planning to do next is develop some resources and professional development in universal design for learning. As Arbert said earlier, for us in New Zealand, that's very much a growing dynamic as well. Lastly, if I may, Rock, just two more minutes. Thank you. I'll share with you key, four key success factors in our journey towards inclusive pedagogy. The first, has been that we have a global agenda in the form of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This has really helped us to design a national strategy, particularly SDG4. And what you see here is our tertiary education strategy, which um, provides guidance to the tertiary sector and a vision as to what we want to achieve. And you'll be very pleased to see that barrier-free access is one of the key objectives in our tertiary strategy. The third key success factor has been legislation, or I should say will be legislation because we've got an act which is going to parliament in September this year, the Accessibility Act. If this act is um, accepted, then Every organization in New Zealand, not just tertiary organizations, but any organization will have to identify barriers to access and remove them. So it's going to be a real game changer for New Zealand and it will really empower people who experience barriers to access. So we're really looking forward to this. The last key success factor has been collaboration, working together with government, tertiary organizations, but also including the student voice, which we find is really important. We still have a long way to go towards achieving a truly inclusive Aotearoa New Zealand, but international collaboration will really help too, because we can learn so much from each other's experiences, which is why we greatly appreciate having the opportunity to be part of your symposium. 
this is my email address if anyone likes to get in touch. And I'd like to thank you very much for listening to our story and giving us the op opportunity to share our story. Kia ora. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Thank you, Mike. Uh, that was very interesting, and it was interesting uh, to hear uh, things like holistic initiative, uh, and so that it requires the whole organization to buy in, and I, I think that's uh, that's very important. And legislation is obviously, for me, anyways, uh, a key role because it, it kind of encourages people to buy in. So I, I see a link between those two things. I'd like to open up uh, the. Uh, Question period. I see there's a hand up by Pauline Claude. Uh, I don't know if uh, I'm not running the microphones. I don't know if Pauline can take them. The uh, there you go, Pauline. So you have a question for the panel. Yeah, I have a question for uh, Annette and Mike actually because I was really surprised to hear that sign language was a, an official language in New Zealand. And I was listening to your, um, your your dyslexia mark, and I was thinking, is is this all possible? This this kind of implementation, because uh, politically, um, there is a there is a general um, climate, politically speaking, that allows you to do such things. And uh, because I I was just stunned to learn that sign language was an official language. I don't know if I am the, the only one here, but uh, but I don't know if you feel that uh, you had support from your government or was it difficult to implement your uh, your, your dyslexia, Mark? Mike? Very good question, Pauline. Um, <clears throat> We've had strong support from the government agency that funds us. That's called the Tertiary Education Commission, and they've been uh, a strong advocate. Having said that, there are other parts of government and of politics that's not that aware of things related to dyslexia and neurodiversity. So I could tell you that the grass was lovely and green here in New Zealand, but it's not completely green, but we have made progress. We are excited by the fact that sign language is uh, an official language. And what's been very interesting, of course, is that during COVID, there have been lots of announcements from our politicians to the country to, because we've done quite well around COVID, and there have been regular announcements by our prime minister and our um, chief executive from our health ministry. And they've always been accompanied by a sign language person. So it's fair to say that sign language is becoming quite a, a popular thing in New Zealand. And we'd like to think that dyslexia and neurodiversity is not far behind. It hasn't been an easy journey though, Pauline. We've, we've really had to struggle, Mike and I, to, to get to where we are now. It wasn't until 2007 that dyslexia was officially recognized by the Ministry of Education. But as Mike said earlier, it's thanks to our Tertiary Education Commission in New Zealand, who has funded this project at Ako Aotearoa, that we've been able to, to get this project off the ground. And there's, there's a great interest in it. Our next step will hopefully be to um, a, a project on designing neurodiverse friendly teaching and learning environments. But our ultimate goal is to promote inclu truly inclusive organizations like some of you have alluded to before. We've made the we've, we've, we've started from dyslexia, we're going towards neurodiversity, but we need to be truly inclusive and include people with all excess needs and disabilities. So for us, it's still an ongoing journey. I think it's an ongoing journey for many of us. And I think that the road has been very bumpy. I'm what I'm um, surprised or maybe I shouldn't be is to see how there are a lot of parallels throughout uh, Quebec, France, uh, New Zealand, uh, Belgium uh, and Ireland, we seem to have all wakened up about 10 years ago and been trying to uh, have been on a journey since then. 
Um, I know there's another, there's a question in the Q&A. Uh, maybe uh, I can read it out. Uh, oh, go ahead. It is uh, directed to Valérie Van Hees. Is your, is your university a model in Belgium? And if yes, how do you explain that inclusive education has been embraced in your, in your university? Um, yeah, but what I explained was that we, we have the legislation in which we are asking our universities to evolve to inclusive universities, so that, that's helping. And as I mentioned, um, yeah, it's a good practice, uh, uh, Odyssey University of Applied Science, but as mentioned, we have already three universities who are taking that approach. And I can say um, in the Flemish community, if we look at the 18 higher education institutions, I think that uh, at this stage, everyone in the Belgium community is convinced um, that uh, diversity breeds excellence. And uh, so the efforts are very high, um, but also at the European level, I think, uh, that um, we should look at diversity. It was also in, 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 um, in another study that we did at the uh, yeah, European level on inclusive mobility, we, we see that diversity is uh, acknowledged and it breeds excellence. So that's, but the, the way is how fast can you move forward uh, into uh, inclusive pedagogies? And we see, for example, in the Flemish community that it's more easier in a uh, university of applied sciences maybe to, to make that change because there we have really more faculties and all the support services are more embedded already in, in the faculties themselves and in the large universities. We see a more central approach where, for example, the disability officer is at a central level and it's much further from uh, the faculties itself. And then it's more difficult, I think, to take that participatory approach. And what we have seen in the University of Applied Sciences, we have more div diversity as well in, in those communities. And it's a bit more easier to move further at university level. They, they touch really upon the, the viewpoints of academic staff. And in universities of applied sciences, we have a little bit more liberty um, in, in the top-down approach and the participatory approach. So that's a little bit the difference, I think. So um, it's a best practice and it's not yet implemented um, at a whole Flemish community level, but we are evolving to it, I think, because a lot of universities now are coming with that and also individual academic staff are coming. I want to be more inclusive. Um, is it okay if I give time to all the students, for example? Yeah. May I ask a quick question, Valerie? Yes. yes. Yeah. I, I was just wondering what support you provided for the university staff to implement the, the new principles. Did you provide professional development for them? Um, yes, they have an educational team and they are giving trainings on inclusion and so on. But here it was more and really um, Yes, support from the Educational Council. If they made clear guidelines and a memo notes and implemented, for example, now in, in this um, university, there was really a an, an change in the legislations. And for example, they made really um, for the exams and extended time a header on the exam copies and teachers have to use that. And there they have to educate the time they provide. And then they also have to provide one third more time so that it's clear for the students that they are all allowed more time. And I think it's by doing such a concrete examples and making your university ready with templates and so on, that that's, I think, the most important topic to make the change more than because we give when we give individual staff trainings, we also always see the people who are interested in diversity. So I think it's really important to, to create frameworks that can be applied and ready in faculties for teachers. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We have normally about a minute left, uh, but I have the uh, Pauline Claude uh, suggested that we might be able to run a little long, so maybe a few minutes or a little longer, especially for the recording. Uh, I have a question of the future. Where do you see the future of inclusion pedagogy? And maybe I'd like to hear Joanne or Arbaire chime in to this 
this, uh, and maybe we do a round table just briefly, but so we've seen from where we've, where we woke up, <laughs> what we've done since, but how do we perceive ourselves in the future? Um, it's a really good question. Um, I presume Ireland is no different, but our sectors are quite, they run quite separate to one another. So it will be, I think, a piecemeal approach. Um, our senior cycle uh, is under review at the moment. Uh, they've just finished a consultation with teachers, parents and students, um, all in not so much UDL specific language, but all basically calling for more flexible um you know, assessment procedures, more autonomous learning, um, you know, like, ba you know, basically describing UDL, but perhaps not not specific to that uh, terminology. Um, at higher education, as I said, there's definitely momentum. Uh, there's an aware, we're in the awareness making uh, period, I think now. Our primary curriculum has just uh, gone for review as well. And there is language around a universal design, perhaps not specific universal design for learning, but certainly the beginnings of that. So, so it's, uh, you know, I, I, I spent a, a 10 years of my career working for a research institute which sought to provide research evidence for policy. And what I learned during that time is that research evidence is often needed in order for policy decisions to be made. So I'd be a, a very big advocate of now's the time for us as, as practitioners and researchers to gather that evidence in order to convince um, policymakers of the, the kind of value of these kinds of approaches. Uh, I think it'll be slow, um, but I think there's a real will and like uh, Valerie mentioned, the, the kind of attitudes of teachers towards these approaches, it's, it's, an, it's an easy sell. Um, it's pushing an open door. It's just a matter of, of, uh, of, of getting the policy kind of backing behind it at this point, I think. Thank you, Joanne. Could I um, just, you ask- Yes, go me, ahead, Mike. You ask where we're going from here. Could I say that one uh, measure of how successful we will be, or we can be, is to the extent to which the business world and maybe the community at large um, embraces um, diversity and other things and and i think right now i believe in the new zealand context there is a real case to be made for selling the ideas for example of the dyslexia friendly quality mark to the business world because um they diverse uh, diverse learners and diverse people can make a major contribution to the world of work and that's a message that we have to sell i believe and certainly in the new zealand context thank you yes agreed and we have to sell it here in quebec and in canada also it's a uh, it's a matter of of steps and scaffolding but i see your mic is open yes to yes to, to answer to the question i completely agree with uh, joan and mike uh, here at the University of Poitiers, let's say these these three last years, uh, we have we are working a lot to create this 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 chain, let's say, of uh, cooperation between the field of research with the practitioners, the teachers, but also the the pedagogical advisors. Uh, it, I think it should be a systemic approach. It can't be only particular intervention here and there. Uh, and um, if I say it more, let's so further from the University of Poitiers in general in France, I think that it seems to me that currently in, in France, everyone's uh, agree. I think everyone agrees that we need to work uh, harder for a more inclusive university. Uh, but however, uh, we have not to forget that there are sometimes, let's say, a lack of consensus for how to achieve this uh, in um, uh, what is important, I think, to understand is that uh, this will not happen overnight, and it's a long process, and it's a very hard process. And as Mike and Annette explain it, uh, it, it sometimes there there are struggles uh, to to arrive to this to some points. And I believe that I, I really believe that we're, we are on the right track. Excellent. Uh, I see the time running out. Did did anybody else want to chime in on this question of where? we see each other where we see our, ourselves for inclusive pedagogy in the next uh, next little while in the next 10 years let's say i'll just very briefly uh, from my part um, 
with the Accessibility Act hopefully being passed in Parliament soon, um, accessibility will be enforced through legislation. So that means that organisations are going to need lots of support in how to create inclusive environments. So uni universal design for learning is at the top of our agenda. We need to create awareness and understanding of what it means and how it can be implemented. Another thing that I was just thinking for the future is that what we're aiming to do too is foster networks within tertiary education organizations so that they can support each other and build internal capability within tertiary education organizations so that they become sustainable in, in, provi in, in providing these measures and creating inclusive environments. So lots of work to be done for the future, but I think the future is looking good and, and promising. Thank you. I think that's a nice conclusion. So uh, I thank everyone. I know there's still some questions in the q and I invite uh, the people who uh, didn't, unfortunately, we, we weren't able to get to their questions, maybe to ask their, their questions directly to the panelists through their email. Uh, I'd like to personally thank all of you, uh, Joanne Banks, Mike Stiles, Annette Van Loen, Arbach Estembari, and Valerie Van Hees. Uh, it was a great an hour and a half. I think we've learned a lot. Uh, I certainly did. And I thank you very much. <laughs>